I'm hoping at least some of you will be surprised to learn, if not alarmed, that cancer can be transmitted from person to person under very special circumstances that I'm going to explain to you. Um, I rather like the idea that, that cancers can be, can, can be considered as being akin to unicellular asexually reproducing parasites. So I want, I want to start the talk before I get into human transmission, asking what it takes to be a successful parasite and then see to what extent cancer cells do this, particularly in the human context. So it, it impresses me when you think about the different lifestyles you see in the, in the natural world that we have almost equal distribution between cooperation being favored and cheating being favored. Now, cheats are very, very common, but cooperation is awfully common as well. And there are lots and lots of examples one can think of for colonial organisms, truly symbiotic organisms like uh, lichens. And multicellularity is a form of cooperation between cells, of course. And social organisms like insects, and apparently humans are supposed to be social as well, although I sometimes doubt it. Um, but you can line up a, a long list of, of, of cheaters as well, um, with lots of examples of mimicry and, and theft uh, and, and overt parasitism. But what strikes me is also interesting is that when, whenever you have a social grouping of any kind selected as being advantageous, uh, colonial bacteria, uh, social insects, and multicellularity is an opportunity for cheats. And in all of those, including social insects and social bacteria, um, there are mutant cheats that can't resist the temptation uh, to take advantage of, of uh, free food, basically. Now, there are lots of restraints on cheating, but it happens all the time. Um, and if you cheat in the context of a social organization, basically you're a parasite. And if that's a multicellular animal, that parasite is a cancer cell. Um, now, just to tell you, you may not, those of you who are evolutionary biologists will, will know this, but it sort of surprised me to learn how common parasitism is. Um, the number of parasitic species is simply extraordinary. I mean, there are 1,000 species just of tapeworms um, and over 100,000 species of parasitic wasps. There's far more than we have mammalian species. So it's an, ex an extraordinarily successful way of life. And in fact, it turns out if you add up the numbers, ignoring viruses and bacteria, that many of which are parasitic, most species are actually parasitic. So it's a prevalent, stable lifestyle for, for those organisms. And you might think, well, how is that possible? How can most be parasitic? There aren't enough hosts to go around. And if, that, if you think that's a conundrum, well, the answer was given 300 years ago in a poem by Jonathan Swift. I'm not going to read it out. You can read it for yourselves. And the truth is that parasites have parasites, and those parasites have parasites. And serve them down well right. Okay? So um, that's the way you can get around with having most species. There are um, multiple... Um, one host can serve many different parasitic species. So there's no doubt that parasitism is a readily, readily available um, trait, a fitness trait, and it can be stable in the evolutionary um, sense. So it's not surprising we see a lot of it. Um, and I don't need to tell most of you this, but, but parasites have played a huge role in evolution in general. So um, some of this is hypothetical, but I think it's very plausible. Um, there's the idea that parasites have been a major driver of biodiversity. That's essentially the Red Queen hypothesis. You have to do all the running you can to stay in the same spot, that being more diverse helps you to, to combat um, parasites. Um, I like this idea very much, and Carlo, you'll be familiar with this as one of your mentors. Hamilton's idea of the reason that sex was invented, there's a lot of discussion about why was sex invented. It's expensive in terms of energy, but one idea is that it gives you more diversity to combat um, parasites as well. And there's no doubt, I, I was an immunologist by training, and we have lots of discussion about why did the immune system evolve, and while it evolved um, um, to, to challenge um, pathogenic organisms, most of which are parasitic. So the evolution of the immune system in vertebrates had a lot to do with invasion by parasitic species. And human history, um, as you're well aware, is, is, is ripe with examples of plagues and pathology, and um, human evolution has been hugely impacted by parasites. I mean, the clearest example of that is with malaria, but there are many, many examples. So I'm going to talk about whether cancer can be considered a parasite and circumstances in which it, it is, but I can't resist telling you this. It's not, not strictly relevant to what we're talking about today, but there's an example of the other way around that I thought was absolutely extraordinary. I encourage you all to read this paper. It's absolutely it's sort of mind-blowing. that This is a parasite that's decided to become a cancer cell. It's a tapeworm. And what happened, it's an anecdote. It's only one patient. I'm not sure it's ever happened um, before, but you could easily miss this. So it's a tapeworm in a, in a patient that had HIV and AIDS. It was immunosuppressed. 
and was diagnosed with cancer. And when they looked at the tumors in the lymph nodes, the liver and the lung, what was a bit odd was that the cells looked too small. And they turned out on genetic analysis to be tapeworm cells. They, looked not, they weren't worms, they were dividing, proliferating cells. The tapeworms have very few dividing cells. They have a stem cell population called miroblasts, and they'd taken over and adopted to disseminating metastasize, metastasizing the, in the patient. And what was also incredibly interesting is that when they were, the genome was looked at, that cancer cell, they had five mutations in genes that are oncogenic in mammals. Uh, one was a kinase and, and four transcription factors. So it adopted the same traits, presumably phenotypic traits, and same type of mutations as seen in bona fide cancer cells. So a parasite can very rarely perhaps become um, what looks very much like a cancer cell. So I should perhaps say what, a, what the definition of a parasite is. I was rather surprised by this because it seems, that, um, it seems not strong enough, but this is what the OED says, that it's, it comes from the Greek meaning to feed at somebody else's table, and it, especially an organism that feeds at the expense of another. Um, we'll come to, not necessarily with transmission. You'd think transmission would be part of it, but it's not formally. Um, so if that's, if that's a definition, then of course cancer is, um, is a parasite because you all know this, cancer cells hijack normal tissue and normal resources um, with pathological consequences. So it is a unicellular parasite by that very simple definition. But is it really, is it really a parasite and is transmission part of it? It's really the question. So if you think about what you need to be a parasite as uh, traits, well, to be successful as a parasite. Well, you need the three things I've listed at the top there. You need, from going from host to host, you're going to need immune evasion. Um, you're going to lead, need proliferative immortality, essentially. And to get both of those traits, you need quite a bit of genetic variation, probably genetic instability. But contrary-wise, you need some stability, otherwise you just crash out eventually. So you need genomic stability. But those are all, we know those are all selectable traits in cancer. We know cancer cells can fairly readily um, work out how to evade the immune system. We know that cancer cells can quite easily adopt proliferative immortality. We've got very clear examples of this. Some of the cell lines that we all work with have been around for many, many decades. HeLa cells, HL60, decades longer than the original donor, and they presumably will go on forever. Interestingly, if you look at the genomes of those cell lines, they're very complex but very stable. So they've probably gone through a phase of instability when there's been strong selection for some of these properties and traits, and then it's been stabilized. Um, but I think we should think, we need to think about transmission. You can't be a successful parasite for very long if you simply kill your host and that's the end of the game. That's not much of a parasite. So the transmission is the bottleneck in a parasitic lifestyle. Um, so the two barriers are very obvious. If you're going from host to host in an outbred species, the first is the immune recognition or allo recognition particularly invertebrates, but presumably invertebrates as well. And the others, you need a root um, of some kind that will preserve viable cells as opposed to a cancer virus or something like, like that. So these are major bottlenecks. And the question is, how, can, how are these breached? Are they breached? And when, when they are breached, what can we discover about immune evasion uh, and the root of migration? So, Tomorrow you're going to hear a lot about this and people who actually work on these models that are really interesting. Um, and the dog, and Tasmanian devil, and the, and the bivalve uh, models. So we don't have many examples of this, but we haven't looked that long. There probably are going to be many more. And so far we've only got, when I lost, check the number, uh, seven clones. So it might be very rare. Uh, we just don't know what the frequency is. And we know something about the transmission routes listed there, sex and biting and maybe filter feeding. And as you'll hear tomorrow, we know something about immune evasion in those in those cases. So these are wonderful examples of serially transmitted cancer. And there is nothing in humans like that. There is no example, apart from one quirky thing I'm going to tell you, of serial transmission. So I think in the dog, at least, one can say this is a bona fide parasite. It's indistinguishable from a parasite. And it took a long time to evolve that, perhaps, because it's a very old clone. And it's a single clone. So what about humans? Um, what are the circumstances in which you can Imagine this might happen from person to person. There are quite a few examples, actually, although each of them is pretty rare. Um, and they fall into two groups um, for very um, different types of um, mechanisms. The first are just called iatrogenic. By that, I mean they c they've been transferred as a result of a medical procedure or an experimental procedure in a lab. So they're accidents, basically. 
and the other is naturally via the placenta. And it's the placenta route that I've been more interested in because it's a kind of natural route um, where there's a risk of this happening. So I'll tell you a bit about the accidents and then talk a bit more about um, why the placenta is a, is a venue for this um, dissemination. So again, it's a, it's a list. I'm sorry about that. I'll just start at the top and work through it. But um, going back 100 years, uh, when people were trying to understand what can, the nature of cancer, there were lots of attempts, mainly by scientists at the beginning, of injecting themselves, believe it or not, with cancer. French scientists seem to be particularly keen on doing that. They all survived, as far as I know. Um, but there were some other attempts that were more systematic in the 1950s and 60s in the US that are somewhat infamous, mainly based in Sloan Kettering in New York, um, where cancers were injected into um, volunteer recipients. And the question is, who were the volunteers? If I tell you there were inmates in the penitentiary, you might raise your eyebrows and think, well, how did that happen? That wouldn't go through an eth ethics committee today. But they were, many of them were um, prisoners in, in, in penitentiaries. Um, fortunately, virtually nothing happened. You get small nodules, and as you would anticipate, they're restrained or rejected. Um, the only example of this, which didn't involve a prisoner, was when a mother volunteered to be the recipient for her daughter's melanoma in order to see if they could generate some kind of immune, immune factors or antibodies or what have you in the blood. And that eight-year-old mother died very quickly of that melanoma, which disseminated. So there's one odd example of this disseminating. Now, I don't know what sort of compatibility there was between the mother and the offspring, in terms of um, cons consanguinity or whatever, but nevertheless, that happened. The other more well-studied example is with transplantation, which you may be familiar with. And this is rather tragic in many ways. So <coughs> recipients who were in need of particularly kidney transplants and later heart transplants, uh, there's always an issue with donors. And donors were used somewhat indiscriminately in the early days of, of transplantation. And many donors were used who either were known to have cancer and died of cancer, or subsequently found to have cancer um, after the death from perhaps perhaps other causes. And there are more than, there are probably 200 examples of this, of recipients who then developed a cancer which could be related to the cancer of the donor. Now, that hasn't happened now for about 20 or 25 years. Now you cannot be a donor if you have cancer, except, strangely enough, if you have brain tumors, you can still be a donor. And the assumption they don't get into the blood. So what's happening if you transplant a kidney or, or um, a heart from a patient with cancer is there are cancer cells in the blood. Of course, we now know that. It wasn't appreciated the cancer cells are in the blood in those days. And the blood within the organ is then transplanted to the recipient. The recipient is immunosuppressed, and then the tumor can grow. Interestingly, in many of those cases when the tumor grows, if you withdraw the immunosuppression, the tumor shrinks and disappears. So again, the immune system can rescue the, rescue the patient. But there are many examples of that with both biomarker transplantation and organ transplantation. The other example, and again, they're very rare. There are just three cases. There may be more, but when I reviewed the literature 18 months ago, I could only find three cases of transfer by needle stick, so the sort of thing we all do in the lab occasionally. Uh, one case involved a surgeon um, operating on a patient with a needle stick. In one of those cases, it metastasized. So again, despite allogeneic um, relationship of donor recipient, one of them was able to take off for some reason and evade the immune system. Two just grew as nodules, which what you um, might expect. So this happens. It's pretty quirky. It's happening less and very little now. It doesn't teach us very much, actually. So I'm going to pass on from that and go to the, the placenta, because it's, it's sort of, I think it's more interesting. Um, well, I find it more interesting. And there, there are three examples of this I'm going to tell you about. One is this tumor you may not be familiar with because it's very rare, choriocarcinoma. Uh, I'll tell you exactly what it is in a moment. But it, this is a tumor that derives from embryonic tissue after conception, and it spreads into to the, to the pregnant mother. The second one is when pregnant mothers have a cancer that spreads into the fetus, that, which is then diagnosed after birth with a tumor, which is the same as the mother's tumor. So that happens. And the third one, which is rather special, is that we studied a lot, is, is monozygotic twins in the womb um, where leukemia can spread and metastasize from one twin to another. So all of this um, relies on um, the, the architecture and the immunological circumstances within the placenta. So 
Um, if you think about it, um, a fetus is an, is an allograft. It should be rejected. So I assume early on in mammalian development, it was really crucial to adopt some immunological tricks for suppressing immunity within the placenta. Otherwise, mum's immune system would recognize paternal antigens on the fetus and it would be rejected. So we know quite a bit about this, not everything, but the interface between the developing baby and the mother's placenta are embryonic trophoblasts. And those cells lack conventional MHC systems that would activate the immune system. They have something called HLA-G, which actually is immunosuppressive. So um, <coughs> and it blocks, and not only doesn't activate the immune system, it blocks NK cells. Secondly, the trophoblast cells release immunosuppressive factors, some of which have been um, classified. And just recently, there's been a very nice paper looking at regulatory T cells in the placenta. It turns out there are three populations of regulatory T cells in the placenta, all of which suppress immune reactions. So there are multiple mechanisms of immune suppression within that niche or environment of uh, the placenta, and that makes a lot of sense because you don't want to lose, lose the developing, developing fetus. So if you look at um, anatomy, and it's, there's a striking feature here of um, the anatomy of the placenta varies according to species, and humans have what's called a hemochorial placenta. This is a placenta with its maximum contact between the fetal cells and maternal blood. In fact, the fetal trophoblasts swim in maternal blood. There's direct contact. There's no barrier whatsoever. So you see these, I've got, I've got a pointer here. These villi here, chorionic villi of trophoblasts, are surrounded by the red as the blood, is mum's blood. And what's even more extraordinary is they continue to slough off. So this might surprise you. Every pregnant woman has in her blood embryonic trophoblasts. They, they regularly slough off and get into the blood. But fortunately, those cells are programmed to die after nine months. Otherwise, we'd have more trouble. And so it doesn't cause any issues, but you can detect them there in every pregnancy. But the fact they slough off tells you there's an inherent risk of cancer here. If any of those cells would acquire appropriate mutations, then there's a problem. Um, so the trophoblasts are on maternal circulation. Not only that, um, many, many women who've had children um, have microchimerism with fetal blood cells persistently present in their blood. Rather surprisingly, they're not all rejected. And there's some ideas that they may be related to some autoimmunities. And we've got immune silence in the placenta. So you begin to see that the placenta has all these arrangements for immune silence, but there's an inherent risk here of cell transfer, maybe in both directions, because of the fact that there's direct contact here between um, the blood of the, um, of the fetus and the mother. Um, so just a bit about chorocosm. I've not worked on this, but I have colleagues who have. So my knowledge is very secondhand, but it's a, it's a very uh, rare tumor. It's a derivative of what's been called a high datiform mole. That's kind of a, a defective um, conception where the embryo fails to develop and develops into a mole-like structure, um, but it's essentially a, a deformed embryo. Um, it, it's made of these trophoblast cells. That's the origin. Um, so it's extra embryonic. And they metastasize to the lung of, of the mother, sometimes during pregnancy, sometimes, sometimes after pregnancy. In the absence of therapy, it can be lethal and was lethal. But actually, chorocosinum was the first disseminated cancer to be cured by chemotherapy, strangely enough, despite its rarity, before the leukemias. And it's 90%, fortunately, it's 90% curable. The cells are incredibly sensitive to chemotherapy, um, cisplatin, for example, so 90% curates, um, so thank, thankfully. And it's incredibly rare. I've, I've tried to calculate the incidence here. It's something like, well, others have already, it's something like one in 50,000 pregnancies, so incredibly rare, but, but very, very interesting. And those cells are immunologically invisible, basically, so they escape, um, fortunately, they're sensitive um, to, to drugs. So that's one example. Um, this is one I've had rather more interest in and been able to do some work on. Um, if you trawl literature over like 100 years and ask how many reported cases are there of cancer spreading from a pregnant lady into offspring, and the number when I last checked was plausible cases, 25, so it's incredibly rare. And I've calculated the risk. Um, it's not that uncommon for a pregnant woman to have cancer, um, relatively speaking. So I've calculated the risk is about, it's probably one in a million, so it's, it's extremely rare. But the nature of those, those cases are pretty interesting. So they tend to be either leukemia or melanoma. You see from those numbers there, but a few cases of lung cancer. So the question is, how do you know their mum's cancer? So you need, you need some genetics, um, basically. But in all those 26 cases, the tumor in the mother and the tumor in the, 
infant was the same. So where it's melanoma or lung cancer, there's, there's just no way you get those tumors in an infant. So it's highly likely to be derived from the mother. The leukemia is more ambiguous. Um, the same tumor in all 25 cases. In six cases, the offspring was a boy, and the chromosomes of the tumor were XX. So that suggests it's come from the mother. And there's only two cases where we've got what I'd say is unambiguous data for transmission. Where we've got microsatellite uh, marker data or clone-specific oncogenic markers uh, that we can use um, to trace the origins. And I'm going to tell you about one of those cases because we were fortunate to get um, samples from a, a Japanese case where we could use both microsatellite markers and um, clone-specific mutations to, to, to demonstrate unambiguously that it was mom's tumor in, in the baby. So this, this is a very um, odd case. Um, the mother, once she was pregnant, was not known to have cancer or leukemia in this case was diagnosed immediately after birth with uh, an acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, with this fusion gene, um, BCR ABL, which activated kinase. Um, the infant was fine at birth until 11 months when it presented with a jaw tumor, which was diagnosed initially as a sarcoma, also had a pleural effusion. But when that sarcoma was looked at by fish probes, it had the BCR ABL fusion that was in the mother's, and you wouldn't find that in the sarcoma. So it's a leukemia fusion gene. So there was an opportunity to try and nail this. Um, I should tell you something about fusion genes, it'll come up again in the moment in the context of twins, that although these BCR ABL fusion genes are common in leukemias and unrelated people, each patient and each clone has a unique DNA sequence of BCR fusing to ABL. And the reason is the breaks in the DNA occur in introns scattered throughout a breakpoint region just idiosyncratically. So if you sequence across the fusion, it's unique to each clone, unique to each patient. It only happens once, in other words. So in this, the question here is, is the BCR able fusion in the child identical to BCR fusion in the mother? Um, and it was, I'll show you that in a moment. We had the microsatellite markers as well to show um, that the tumor was maternal in origin. And I'll tell you something interesting about HLA as well in this patient in just a moment. So about, published about 10 years ago. So this is detailed data. Um, we had the BCR, B, BCR ABL was cloned from the pleural effusion of the infant. We, the only material we had from mum was um, a s small sliver of a section from a bone marrow biopsy. We were able to retrieve DNA from that. Um, after we had the sequence from the pleural effusion of the infant, we could then, using um, qPCR here, show that sequence was present. And we could pull it out and resequence it. That sequence was present in mum as well as child, so it was identical. We went back to the child's neonatal blood spots and found the same sequence there in three out of four blood spots. So it was there at birth in the infant, although it took 11 months to manifest as a, as a tumor. So this is, this is unambiguous evidence for transmission in at least, at least this case. Now, I wanted to tell you about the HLA because this begs the question, well, how could this work? Why would the baby, it has some sort of immunity, why would it not reject um, this tumor. Now, it might be immunological tolerance, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but something very interesting happened with the HLA that we discovered here. And that is that HLA was deleted, but it's deleted in a particular fashion that, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm just doing this schematically rather than showing the raw data. So let's suppose those are the two LH, HLA alleles, type 1 and type 2, in the father and the mother with these colors. And the infant would be um, one of those, um, this color of the mother, that one. Um, What's the tumor? Well, the tumor is the mother, so it would have been those two. But what had happened in the tumor was that the allele that is mismatched between the mother and the infant has gone. And the other allele, which is not mismatched, has been duplicated. So it's got rid of the mismatch. Now, if you think about immunoselection, how would it work? That's, that's what you'd do. You'd, you'd, you'd want to select for any cell that had been able, by chance, presumably, to, to delete that one. You wouldn't select for deletion of the other one because there's no mismatch. So that makes a lot of sense um, and suggests this is a result of some kind of potent immunoselection. Um, I assume the deletion occurred in the mum, where there are enough cells for it to happen, but then within the baby's immune environment, whatever it is, um, this selection has happened. Now, you might want to ask, well, does this sort of thing happen in any other circumstances? When we get immunoselection in cancer, do you select for one or both alleles? It's quite interesting. Um, now, if it's within one patient, you might think you'd have to select against both alleles. What would be the point of deleting one of them? 
And there are quite good examples of that now. If you look at resistance to immunotherapy in patients, so it's a patient's own T cells going in, and you get resistance and relapse, and you get a, a different mechanisms of resistance, but one of them is lack of immune recognition. It's quite difficult, if you think about it, numerically, to delete both alleles in one cell. And what tends to happen is not that. You tend to delete beta-2 microglobulin. And that's because without beta-2 microglobulin, which would be a single change, you can't assemble the HLA molecule on the cell surface. So they're downregulated. And that happens regularly in patients escaping immunotherapy. There's one situation in cancer therapy where exactly this happens. And I want to tell you that best because it reinforces this kind of potent immunoselection. And this is in a transplant situation where patients with leukemia are transplanted with a partially matched bone marrow donor. Now, you might say, well, why would you partially match when you could completely match? And the reason that's done is that the T cells in the donor, if they're partially matched, can exert some control over the leukemia. So it's done for that reason. Now, quite a lot of those patients, unfortunately, relapse. And the really interesting thing in two large cohorts in Spain and Italy, where they've been well studied, is in the relapsed patients, the HLA is deleted. But it's always just the mismatched allele in the partial mismatch, not the shared allele. So it's what you would expect, I think, in terms of the specificity of um, immune editing. But it clearly happens, and there's strong selective pressure for that. So if you, insert, if you put enough selective pressure on, you'll see the emergence of immunologically neutral um, cancer cells. So an important part of trying to be a parasite, and I call these incipient parasites, is you have to do something about um, HLA-based recognition. So the last example is, is something we've worked on a lot, um, not specifically from the point of view of cell-cell spread, but because it's, it's a way of getting at the natural history of leukemia. And that's by studying um, concordant leukemia and identical twins. So concordant leukemia means both twins are diagnosed with leukemia, not necessarily at the same time. But it tends to be within one year, but it can be up to nine years apart, but they have the same leukemia. And the question, from, and this was observed many years ago, decades ago, the question has always been, well, what's going on there? Is that genetic susceptibility? Or is it possibly person-to-person -person spread? And it turns out to be person-to-person -person spread. I'm going to explain how that works. Um, so first of all, it's quite difficult to study this because leukemia is rare, and then only one in, um, one in 200 cases will be in a twin. So we're able to do this because we've got a network of colleagues who are very collaborative throughout the world, and we've been alerted to twin, twin leukemias from those colleagues, and, and samples have been provided to do some genetic analysis. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, now, I can't resist just reminding you how the, the twins have, have been um, a very popular topic in, in medical research for many, many years. And Francis Galton, you may or may not know, is Charles Darwin's cousin. And he was the first to propose we could use twins to study the, um, the relative contribution of nurture versus nature and all sorts of characteristics. Um, that was pretty interesting. He was also the father figure of eugenics. So he's got lots that he's pretty well responsible for. Um, putting that on one side, can, can I remind you briefly of what happens during um, fetal development of, of, of twins? Because this, um, it's very different in dizygotic versus monozygotic, as I'm sure you know. So dizygotic twins are like any other siblings. They just happen to be coincidental fertilization of two eggs at the same time. So you finish up in two separate placentas, and they're 50% the, genetic sharing, 50% genetic identity, like any other siblings, and they can be one male, one female. The monozygotic twins, as you know, it's a single egg that's fertilized, and the egg splits. And what's critical to the cell story is when the egg splits, the timing of that. If it splits in the first three days, the embryos finish up um, dichorionic in two separate placentas with separate blood supplies. If it splits between three and seven days, they finish up in the same placenta. And I'm going to show you in a moment what that means for blood supply. If there's a much later split, you have so-called... Um, conjoined or Siamese twins. And some of you might have seen on BBC television the past few nights this amazing surgery on um, Siamese twins at Great Ormond Street in London with, whose heads were joined at the top. It's amazing surgery. Um, so that happens, and they're, they're fortunately very, very rare. Um, so just, this is, a mono, this is a single placenta. So here's the amnionic film that goes between the two embryos. Here's one umbilical cord. Here's another umbilical cord. And what we've known since the 1880s with pathology that was done uh, in, in Germany by a guy called Schatz, who injected dyes into the blood vessels, 
is that there are anastomoses between these vessels of one twin and another. It can be vein, 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 artery, artery, vein, artery, artery. So they're all kinds, and they're rather asymmetric. But the result of that is that all identical twins, if they share a single placenta, are blood cell chimeras. They share each other's blood. Um, <clears throat> the consequence of that that we've known about, well, it was diagnosed, I think, first in 1948, is what's called the twin-twin transfusion syndrome. And that arises because of this asymmetry of these anastomoses. One twin will get more blood than the other. And that's a common cause of morbidity and mortality in twins. About 25% of twins um, have this twin-twin transfusion syndrome. So as I said, it was diagnosed in 1948. Here's a picture from 17th century of twin-twin transfusion syndrome spotted by this um, German pathologist Berger in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. These are actually infant offspring of the mayor of Amsterdam. And you can see they die shortly after birth. Um, if, you have two, uh, if you have an excess of red blood cells, you're polycythemic. If you have uh, insufficient numbers, you're, uh, you're anemic. And that's a typical phenotype of twin-twin transfusion syndrome. So as, as long as there are twins, you're going to get this um, uh, rather awful phenomenon. But the point is there are blood cell chimeras. So you can imagine if a cancer develops in a fetus, uh, to develop an embryo or fetus, and if it gets into the blood, it almost inevitably has to get into the other twin. Um, so here's some of the data on concordance, and it depends what you look at. So if you take leukemias of a particular kind that they derive from so-called pro B cells, with particular um, oncogenic fusions, um, we've studied quite a few of these, even though they're rare. Their concordance rate appears to be 100%. So if it gets in, if it's in one, it's in the other. Um, actual clinical disease, 100%. If you look at the more common forms of leukemia, and when we have more cases of twins the concordance rate is 10 to 15%. So when this was first observed, the conclusion was, well, 10 to 15% might be generated in utero, and the other 75% are generated after birth. And it turns out not to be that, so I'll explain in a moment. If you look at adults with twins, you don't have any concordance of disease that's detectable. If you look at other pediatric cancers, there are a few other cases that look as though they're twin-twin. Uh, a couple of cases of neuroblastoma and some rare histiocytic monocytic um, tumors, but it's strikingly the case in acute and lymphomastic leukemia. So what's happening now? Well, I'm, I'm not going to show you the raw data. I'm going to do the summary data and explain what happens. Now, fortunately, we have access to these fusion genes that are clone-specific, and fortunately, again, they are the initiating lesions. So they are the earliest events. So if things are going to be shared, they should be present. So we've got 12 cases there listed there with these um, Acronyms you won't be familiar with. ETV6 trunk one is a transcription factor fusion gene. Hyperdiploidy, extra copies of chromosomes. BCR able again. And three cases in infants that have this MLL fusion. <coughs> MLL is a master regulator of transcription, a major chromatin and modifier. So these are all concordant cases. So what we're able to do is to do the genomic, comparative genomics of the two twins and deduce whether they are one clone or two clones of, of leukemic cells. And what we find in all 12 cases is that it's the same clone. Now, I don't know which twin it came from. You, you can't know in which direction it was. But clearly, it came from one twin because of the uniqueness of clone-specific markers. It's been shared with the other twin. Um, if you look at the full genomics of leukemias, they're different, as you'd expect, because you need, in most of these cases, you need more than one mutation. So the postnatal mutations are all different. Um, so. Now, there aren't an awful lot of mutations in leukemias compared to solid tumors, but we have a total of, in that set of 44 copy number changes and 17 um, non-synonymous um, variants, and they were all distinct in the twins. All, the only thing that was shared other than the odd passenger mutation was, in whole genome sequencing was the initiating mutation. So that happened before birth, and everything else you need to get leukemia uh, happens af af after birth. Um, and this is quite a striking example of that. When we, we did single cell sequencing of a pair of these twins, I mean, we had whole genome sequencing, and, um, and drew up these phylogenetic trees. So these look completely different. These are two patients, but they're the same clone, but they've got very different looking phylogenetic trees. But, but if you trace them back, um, they have the same trunk at the bottom, the same root at the, at the bottom. And all of this um, diversification has happened after birth, and of course, it's distinct. Actually, it's rather parallel. The same sort of genes come up. Um, but it generates different phylogenetic um, architectures, as you, as you might expect, despite origin from the same single cell. 
So what's in a way even more interesting is this, and I show this picture with permission of the parents. We study this twin pair quite a lot, and other twin pairs. And what, what happens when the twins are discordant, but they're monochorionic and monozygotic? Wouldn't you expect the leukemia to get into the other twin? And how come it's only 10 to 15% risk? But if I tell you you need more than one mutation, you can imagine what might happen. You share the first mutation, and there's discordance for the second mutation. And that basically is what happens. So um, we've got a number of these twins. I'm glad to say that these twins who were diagnosed uh, 16 years ago now, Yep, uh, no, sorry, 13 years ago now. I'm now, I'm now healthy, um, very well, um, flourishing 16 year old. So the, the, twin on, the twin on the right I never developed leukemia. The twin on the left did extremely well with curative chemotherapy and is absolutely fine. But here's what we've learned. We've had access to, uh, to six peers here. This is quite a delicate issue. There's some ethical issues, and we have to get, have the parents really signed up to do this sort of thing. So we have six peers where one has leukemia and the other one does not. And we characterize, the, we do the genomics of the leukemic case and then use that as markers to look in the healthy child. So you look at the blood, not the bone marrow, the blood of the healthy child. And what we find in every case is that the healthy child has present and persistent the pre-leukemic clone with the same marker as the leukemic child. So the fusion gene, for example, whatever it is, or hyperdiploidy. Now, in this situation, you're into counseling and advice because the risk is quite high, 10 to 15%. So for several of these patients, we've followed them for up to 10 years. Um, one of them has gone on to get leukemia and the rest have not. And it's interesting that these pre-leukemic clients persist for about 10 years. They just sit there. And even in the cured patient, the pre-leukemic clone is still there. So that's pretty interesting. So this is a unique way of getting at clonal evolution in cancer because you've got a relic of, of the pre-leukemic status there from the same clone but it's stuck at that phase. So I'm going to draw a few conclusions and then a bit more speculation and a few anecdotes at the end as well. So if I just summarize what's happened in these situations and, and how it's happened. So with chorio carcinoma, we've got immune evasion works because of immunological silence, basically, in the placenta, which is intrinsic to the trophoblast because of the needs of, to preserve the uh, life of the fetus as an allograft. From mother to fetus, um, we've got this one example of, um, of deletion of mismatched MHC. There might be immunological tolerance. And there's, I don't want to confuse you here, but there's another story here about immunological tolerance, that, that in cattle, dizygotic twins share the same placenta, believe it or not, and, share, and are, are clearly chimeric with each other. And they tolerate each other's cells. And, this led to the discovery of immunological tolerance by my immunological mentor, Peter Medawa, for which he got the Nobel Prize. And it turns out in cattle that are dizygotic and share each other's blood, you can transplant between them and the skin grafts and grafts are not rejected. So that was the phenomenon of immunological tolerance. So the immune system of the very young is very susceptible to tolerance. So we also have to bear that uh, into account as a mechanism here. Now, what's a bit odd, or maybe a bit odd, is that there isn't an example I'm aware of of fetal or embryonic cancers going into mother. Um, now, many, probably most pediatric cancers are initiated during embryonic or fetal development. So you might think we should see some of this. Um, but of course, the fetal cell has, has got paternal antigens on, and you know, a lot of the placenta may be an immunoprivileged site. The rest of the mother's body is, is not. It's not like a trophoblast cell that is invisible. So I imagine that pediatric cancer cells do get into mum and are then rapidly rejected. There's just one example of that from a colleague of mine in Dusseldorf on Burkhardt who looked in the blood of a newborn mother who had one of these very malignant infant leukemias. And he found the infant leukemia cells in the mum at three months, and by six months, they'd gone. So I think that, that might happen. By the way, I'm not backtracking a bit. You might, have, you might ask me, how come you have 100% concordance with those infant leukemias? And the answer to that is that all you need genetically to make a leukemia is done and dusted by the time of birth. And the reason it's done and dusted is you only need one mutation. The MLL fusion is sufficient. And we did the genomics of that, and you did some the genomics of it. There's essentially only it's one of these rare tumors, where it's, although it's very malignant in a few other cases in pediatrics, it's enough to give you a malignant tumor. Um, so no examples, really, of fetal to mother. Twin-twin uh, is, is a unique situation where there might be tolerance, but basically there's no genetics disparity. So perhaps you wouldn't expect um, to see any uh, rejection. And the persistent chimeras. And I've talked about the um, reversible immunosuppression in, in recipients. 
So where does that leave us? Um, in terms of lessons, it's incredibly rare, so there's nothing to be concerned about or alarmed about. Um, but it, it's always possible, isn't it, that we're missing these cases. Unless you look for it, you wouldn't see it. Um, so I suspect we're underestimating it. Um, the question I'd ask is, can you imagine any scenario in which transmission would be serial, person to person to person? It's difficult to imagine that, isn't it? But, but maybe we could. And what about other routes? I've talked about the placenta and iatrogenic, but what about mosquitoes? And mosquitoes transmit malarial parasites. Why couldn't they transmit cancer cells? Could that happen? What about sex? In dogs, the transmission route is sexual contact. What about the sexual route to humans? It's a delicate subject, but could it happen? Okay, so, can you take some more anecdotes? I don't expect you to take these seriously, but because they are anecdotes. But Here's one case of the nearest I can get to serial transmission. This was an organ donor who happened to have chorea carcinoma. And I can't tell from the, the past literature whether that was known or not at the time she became an organ donor when she died, but obviously her tumor is derived from the embryo. Her organs went into three separate individuals and they all developed chorea carcinoma. So that's one to one to three other people. So that's five people with the same tumor. So that's quirk example, but it happens. What about sexual transmission? Surely that's not possible. Um, now you might be surprised now people have talked about this for a very long time. Um, back to the French, they could discuss this, of course. So in the 18th century, there was something that medics called cancer à deux, when they observed um, concurrent cancer between a man and a woman, the woman having cervical or vaginal cancer, and the man having penile cancer. Suggestion was it's been transferred between one and the other. Now, it's sort of right, but it's not cells. It's almost certainly HPV. And actually, quite recently, someone did a genetic analysis of these couple cases. And the cells, the male cells were male, and the female cells were female. And presumably what's happening, if there is transmission between those particular individuals, is, is HPV, which is something quite different, of course. Um, so can it happen? Well, I'm going to tell you that it has happened. I think it's going to be incredibly rare. This case, I'm only telling you about because it's been presented in meetings, a poster. For reasons I don't understand, it's not published, but I've, I've been privy to all the data. And it's pretty convincing. If it wasn't, I wouldn't tell you. It would just be ridiculous. But there is a case of sexual transmission of cancer in humans. Um, so here it is, um, in a nutshell. This, this woman was diagnosed with a, with a transitional cell carcinoma of the endometrium, which is incredibly rare in the endometrium. So that was immediately suspicious. Um, but what caused rather more alarm was when they did some, um, some situ hybridization on the tumor and it was XY in this lady. So then the question was asked, well, how do you explain this? Anything interesting in your family? Yes, my husband had recently died of transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. Okay. So then a genetic fingerprint was done with microsatellite markers and this tumor was indeed derived from that tumor. So I've been trying to get the DNA from it. The DNA exists on these two samples. I've been trying to get it for whole genome sequencing, and we're still hoping to do that, which would nail it. But I think the evidence is already pretty persuasive from the microsatellite markers. That this is male to female transmission. It's hard to think of any other route other than sexual. And one can think with bladder and endometrium that that's possible. So it's an anecdote. It's almost meaningless. But it can exceptionally happen as a route. And I guess I looked hard enough, I'd find a mosquito case. But I haven't done that yet. Um, so here's a summary. Um, I think cancer cells are incipient parasites, which means they want to be parasites, and they don't often succeed. But they're parasitic, um, short-term parasites at least. Um, they can acquire all the traits you need, um, and transmission is the real bottleneck. Um, all the traits you need to be a parasite. Now, the placenta is only, the only natural route that we know about. The other routes, sex or mosquitoes, if they uh, operate at all, are incredibly rare. Um, so immune recognition, particularly in an outbreak population like humans, is going to be very potent. So we don't have many routes for transmission. The other point I was going to make is that, that um, professional parasites, obligate parasites, learn how to downregulate their virulence. So there's no point in killing your host before you've been transmitted. So many parasites actually have less virulence than they start off having. And of course, cancer cells, if we don't treat the patients, are very virulent and they kill the host. So that's not a smart move if you want to be a parasite. And, um, that's another restraining factor, I guess. Um, and that's a, just to remind you, in case you feel a bit queasy about this and you know people with cancer, 
it's safe to, to have physical contact with patients with cancer, and it's extremely rare. So, so thank you very much. Thanks, Mel. That was great. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the role of um, sort of immune suppression. Um, how important do you think that is in all of these cases for any sort of transmission to be successful? Um, well, it's clearly critical in the case of the transplants. Um, as evidenced by the fact all the recipients who developed cancer were immunosuppressed, and when you release the immunosuppression, the tumor resolves. So it's critical for those. Um, I'm not sure. In the case of the placenta, there is quite potent immunosuppression from trophoblasts. So I think it's relevant there. It's not relevant to the twins, mm -hmm. I imagine. There's no immunosuppression there. Because it doesn't need to be. There's nothing to be recognized. I guess the reason I was asking is it just would seem that the immune system would recognize non-self, right? But I guess twins is where that situation might not be relevant. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the fetus that's getting mums, um, I don't think, well, there's not immunosuppression in a, fetus, in a newborn. What there is is this neonatal tolerance phenomenon. So you're quite likely to be kind of tolerant um, rather than, that's not really immunosuppression. Of course, that just put a high selective pressure for the escape mutants that are immunologically invisible as an immunotherapy. Yeah. Trevor. <laughs> no, that's not a transmissible cancer. That's just a germline mutation. It's like, it's like saying my brown eye color is a transmissible nasty. It's not. It's just, it's just a transmissible. No, in what sense would you think it's in what sense would you think is it transmissible cancer? Just it's transmissible susceptibility at the DNA level, but that's something else. Your whole body is precancerous. And because your whole body's precancerous, yeah. Now, we're talking about transmission of cells, basically. Yeah. I was wondering if anyone's looked at the HIV positive community to see if there are pairs of people that couples that have cancer, that anyone looked at that? For Interesting possibly. you should raise that. I, I remember discussing this more than a decade ago, maybe 20 years ago, with Robin Wise, my colleague of mine who works on HIV, and I, we were trying to think, what would be a situation where you might expect to see it? And we thought, well, what about AIDS patients with Carposi sarcoma? Because they're immunosuppressed and the skin, there's a superficial tumor, and I don't know if anybody's ever looked at that, but that would be where I'd, I'd look at that, because there must be a, a possibility there, at least, because there's immunosuppression coupled with superficial tumors. Yeah. So I haven't seen a report, but I probably hasn't been looked at. Yes, but interesting. Are, are there any potential transmission cases from non-human mammals that you might associate with? I'd say it again, I didn't quite catch it. Potential transmission of human cells from either fetus or other, or the other way around in non-human mammals? In non-human non models? Yeah, in, oh, in models. Um, uh, yeah, other mammals, non-human mammals. Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of it. I mean, it'd be interesting to try and model that. I, I don't know how big an animal colony you need to see it. And obviously, you could, you could fool around with the immune system. You could have different degrees of compatibility. It's something you could model, clearly. But I'm not aware of that being done. Uh, so to, to follow up on that, yeah. you're very good in knowing all the various mouse gem models where uh, you know, these, the, the mice are breeding and have cancer. Um, whether there would be any kind of transmission. Of course, the, the babies get it anyways, but the, you, you would expect, if you could see it there somehow and track, it, yeah. maybe. You might, uh, um, particularly if you use germ-free mice or SPF mice, where the immune system is very much non-functional. Um, you might well see it, yeah. I'm talking about the microbiome deficiency in those mice, so their immune system doesn't seem to function very well in terms of rejection. Well, yeah, thanks very much for a great talk. I just wanted to ask you, are you surprised that adults uh, have never documentedly been shown to have uh, linked, adult twins have not been shown to have uh, tumors that have the same origin? Um, 
I guess I'm, I'm, I think for that, to, for that to occur, you need the initiation mutation to occur before birth. So some, some work that I've, I've seen presented shows that in hematopoietic malignancies, the first mutation in adults has been timed back all the way to very early years. So I, potentially could have also yeah, happened in You need that. I mean, I've seen data in identical twins with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and they're clearly two separate clones. I'd be, I'd be interested to know what that data is, because I'm not aware of any data that suggests in adult leukemia, there's no reason why it couldn't happen in mm -hmm. theory. Um, I'm not aware of any data that shows definitively it's prenatal. I've tried to get at that question. We've tried to get these neonatal blood spots that we've, we've shown a, um, a mutation positive in children with, a, with leukemia. If we could get the blood spots from adults with leukemia to see if any of their blood spots are positive, mm. that would help us with that. Yeah. It's been difficult to get those samples. So it might happen occasionally. I, mean, I can imagine some adult tumors where the first hit is in utero. I'd go for, I'd guess, testicular cancer. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of evidence for that with kit mutations. Um, and th that might not manifest until you're in your 30s, but nevertheless, the first hit is in utero. So there, there might be a few other examples in adults, or in young adults at least. Thanks.